the first type of acute coronary syndrome we will deal with is termed ST elevation myocardial infarction, or STEMI for short. When an atheromatous plaque ruptures in a coronary vessel and the clot which forms completely obliterates the vascular lumen, the entire thickness of the myocardial wall supplied by that vessel becomes ischemic and is at risk of infarction. In the example shown here, the patient has developed a complete occlusion of the artery which supplies the lateral wall of the left ventricle. In this horizontal section, the ischemic area in the lateral wall of the left ventricle is shown in grey. If the blockage of the arterial lumen persists, necrosis begins in the subendocardial region and in the subsequent hours spreads outwards in a wave of cell death which may ultimately involve the full thickness of that region of the myocardial wall. At all stages of this process, characteristic changes are produced in the ECG leads directly overlying the region of myocardium that the occluded vessel supplies. As the region of myocardium affected in this example lies directly under leads V5, V6, lead 1 and AVL, the ECG changes we are about to discuss are observed in these leads. We will examine these changes in lead V6 as an example. You will remember from section 1 that normal T waves tend to be slightly asymmetrical in shape and less than 50% of the height of the preceding OR wave. Within the first few minutes of complete vessel occlusion, T waves in the leads overlying the affected area rise in amplitude. The mechanism underlying these hyperacute T wave changes is unknown. In these early stages, hyperacute T wave changes are followed by a very characteristic ECG abnormality in the affected leads. The line on an ECG readout connecting the end of the QRS complex and the T wave is called the ST segment. Normally all myocytes are depolarized at this time and there is no electrical flow in the cardiac muscle. We'll see later that there are important exceptions, but under normal circumstances, as there is no electrical activity present at this time, the ST segments in all leads are expected to lie on the isoelectric line. In the minutes following hyperacute T wave changes, the ST segments in leads overlying the myocardial region deprived of arterial blood supply begin to rise above the isoelectric line. The mechanism underlying this ST elevation is poorly understood. It may be due to abnormal currents generated between normal and ischemic tissue during the time period of the ST segment. This so-called injury current moving towards the leads overlying the damaged region of myocardium would be expected to produce a positive deflection in their readouts, raising the ST segments. Although the role of an injury current in generating ST elevation is controversial, it is a very useful concept when trying to understand the patterns of changes produced on the ECG by occlusion of different vessels. Whatever the mechanism generating the phenomenon, ST segment elevation on an ECG is the hallmark of evolving myocardial infarction secondary to complete occlusion of a coronary arterial vessel. In the absence of treatment, peaked T waves and ST segment elevation are followed by alterations to the terminal portion of the QRS complex. As in this example, in a lead in which the QRS complex ends with an OR wave, the OR wave rises in amplitude. In contrast, if infarction occurs under leads in which the QRS complex ends with an S wave, the S wave may disappear. These transient changes to the terminal portion of the QRS complex reflect worsening crisis in the oxygen-starved ventricular wall and probably result from progressive ischemia 
and necrosis of the Purkinje fibres, a tissue more resistant to death than working muscle. Peak T waves, ST segment elevation and alterations to the terminal portion of the QRS complex are the early changes of acute myocardial infarction secondary to complete occlusion of a coronary arterial vessel. If these early ECG changes are recognized and the vessel reopened using either thrombolysis or direct coronary angioplasty, the progression of the infarction can be halted in its tracks and myocardium at risk of death salvaged. If left untreated, however, the full thickness of the region of myocardium supplied by the occluded vessel may die. This is associated with a poorer outcome for the patient and an interesting ECG phenomenon developing between 9 to 12 hours after vessel occlusion or in the days following infarction. The ECG leads looking directly at the infarcted area may develop an abnormality termed pathological Q waves. You will remember from section 1 that a Q wave exists if the first deflection of the QRS complex is negative. In a normal person, the left to right movement of current during depolarization of the interventricular septum can produce an initial negative deflection in the QRS complex in the left lateral leads. But this negative activity is rapidly overwhelmed by current spreading through the left ventricle. This is a physiological Q wave. It is limited in magnitude and duration. We will now examine what happens when the full thickness of myocardium under lead V6 is dead. Lack of depolarizing flow through the dead segment results in a reduction of OR wave activity in the lead. And with no current traveling through the dead left ventricular muscle underneath it, the lead now has an uninterrupted view of septal depolarization. In effect, the infarct has created a window through which lead V6 can see the entire process of septal depolarization, and the recorded Q wave becomes deeper and more prolonged. As a rule of thumb, a pathological Q wave tends to be deeper than two small squares and greater than one small square in duration. A more precise definition of pathological Q waves will be given in the quiz section. We've seen that tall symmetrical peaked T waves are an early ECG finding in STEMI. As shown here, as the process of infarction evolves, the T waves may demonstrate a further abnormality developing at a variable time point after occlusion. In a given ECG lead, T waves are generally concordant with the QRS complex, so that in a lead with a dominant OR wave, such as V6, the T waves are normally upright. However, in a lead looking directly at an acute MI, the T waves may flip and become inverted. The timing of this phenomenon is highly variable. It may occur early, in the hours following vessel occlusion, or may take days to develop, or may not occur at all. The mechanism underlying this change is controversial. The process of clot formation in acute MI is dynamic, and there is some evidence that T-wave inversion may actually reflect reperfusion of the area supplied by the vessel as it recannulates either spontaneously or in response to treatment. In support of this view, flipped T waves are commonly seen to develop shortly after thrombolytic therapy is initiated for STEMI. Whatever the mechanism of their generation, flipped T waves generally return to the upright configuration in the week following infarction but occasionally can persist as a permanent marker of the infarct on the patient's ECG. The sequence of ECG changes associated with complete coronary arterial occlusion described here is a useful generalization. Before we move on, we want to emphasize one of many variants on this sequence.
The traditional view of pathological Q waves as a late and permanent marker of irreversible myocardial death has been modified in recent years. It is important to be aware that in a proportion of cases Q waves and loss of OR wave activity may develop very early in the course of STEMI. In this situation, the presence of Q waves still implies that the muscle underlying the lead is electrically inactive and failing to depolarize, creating an electrical window into the left ventricle. However, although not actively depolarizing, the affected myocardium is still viable and potentially salvageable with timely thrombolysis. Such early Q waves may disappear from the patient's ECG and normal R wave progression may be restored if vessel patency is re-established within the appropriate time frame. Hence, pathological Q waves may occur early in the course of STEMI and these early Q waves may be transient, disappearing with successful treatment. This illustrates a point. You should not time the onset of an ST elevation MI from analysis of the ECG alone. The time of onset of chest pain reported by the patient must be taken into account. So to recap, persistent complete occlusion of the lumen of a coronary artery or one of its major branches places the full thickness of myocardium supplied by that artery at risk of infarction. Within seconds to minutes of vessel occlusion, symmetrical peaked T waves are observed in the leads directly overlying the blood-deprived area of myocardium. This is followed by elevation of the ST segments above the isoelectric line in these leads, and this in turn is followed by alterations to the terminal portion of the QRS complex. The development of pathological Q waves occurs 9 to 12 hours after the onset of occlusion or in the days following infarction. T wave inversion may be seen in the affected leads at a variable time point following occlusion. While ST segment elevation generally resolves within days and T wave inversion within weeks following the infarction, Late pathological Q waves are a permanent marker of such an MI on the patient's subsequent ECGs. However, the presence of Q waves should not be used to time the onset of an MI, as early transient Q waves are a common variant. We will now go on to discuss the identification of the culprit vessel in ST elevation MI.